to the Buy Box Bandits podcast. All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Buy Box Bandit podcast. It's a fantastic Sunday night. We have another great guest tonight. We have my man, Oliver Flips, well-known on Twitter in the reselling space. He's a great father, all-around good guy, and a full-time reseller that has an interesting story, actually, during the pandemic, going from one day having a job, the next day not having a job, kind of having his back against the wall, and then building this awesome business that he has now reselling and building out a successful personal brand on Twitter. So we're excited to dive into that a little bit, kind of learn more of his story, how he went zero to one and beyond, and how some of you guys can do the same. So Oliver, we're just going by Oliver. My bad. I started off like that. But yeah, how are you doing tonight, man? Yeah, I'm well. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, never better. Glad uh, it's hard to find people to talk to about reselling, you know, in everyday life. So we got to take it to these digital spheres and excited to give some value to our awesome viewers tonight. But yeah, Garrett checking in as well. Um, yes, sir. Yep. All right. So take us back to the s- scenario I slightly mentioned a few seconds ago, but during the pandemic, kind of where you got started with reselling and how that all kind of got started there. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm going to start a little earlier because actually it has some relevant context. Mm-hmm. I the first time I got fired from my job unexpectedly was in 2016. And my boss got sued by his uncle and the company had to shut down. And I was, this was, I had just gotten a big promotion. I was like the head of the company uh, running the entire sales department, the owner. And there was another guy who was new there and he had just been hired to run the operations. And the two of us together were going to run the company. And I, it, this was maybe two or three days before my second child was born. So I was freaking out. I just lost all my income. What do I do? <laughs> well, we, me and the operations manager decided to get together and say, Hey, okay, this company just shut down and they're going to put a lot of their customers in a tough spot because we're, you know, this company was fulfilling like hundreds of thousands of dollars a week in auto parts for big names across the country, like Advanced Auto Parts, AutoZone, WorldPack, um, Auto Part International, big jobbers and warehouses. And so we said, hey, maybe we should get together and see if we can just like take those customers because we're not going to get sued by this guy's uncle. So we called the Chinese suppliers. We said, hey, you've got inventory on pallets on the way to the US and this company just went out of business and you're going to lose that money. You're not going to be able to get it back. If you reroute it to us, we will try and sell it and we'll try and capture that business. Just give it to us on consignment, make it a loan. We'll try and sell it as quickly as possible. And then, you know, if it works great, we'll all stay in business and have an income. If it doesn't, you're going to lose it anyway. So they said, yes, it was like 350 grand worth of inventory. So we got a couple of storage units. We got the inventory. I made a phone call our first day in business. I got an $80,000 order that we could get wired immediately. And so we had starting capital. So that was my first business, started an automotive company and it's still alive and well, doing a few million a year. I sold out to my partners and I went to work for another company because I didn't like the automotive industry. I saw the tariffs, China, everything like that was making me nervous. And so I went to work for a company that designed truck parts. And that's where I was in the lockdowns. Uh, The thing that made it a gut punch My boss, who was the owner of the company, I reported to him, I ran the sales department. He had just been diagnosed with acute leukemia and went into uh, chemo like immediately because it was the really aggressive kind of leukemia, the acute kind. And so I actually stepped up and did like half of his job and the operations manager did the other half. And we kept the company afloat while he was basically incoherent for four months. And then he went into remission. Everybody's celebrating. He comes back to work. It's a Tuesday. Uh, I remember. I remember (laughs) my wife said, because my wife said, who gets fired on a Tuesday? So it's Tuesday. We have our first conference call since he's been back. And he says, we're going to let you go. And I said, oh. And he said, "Uh, I can't give you a severance. And uh, I I appreciate everything you did while I was out, but we're going to let you go. And, and this is in, in April or March. This is in of, April of 2020. Year. Yeah. So this is like, you know, right in the heat of everything. So dude, I had no idea you had like 
like this is serious corporate experience you know we're talking about like millions of dollars and stuff like that i had i had no idea so you're one of the few people on twitter who i would say is qualified to make you know judgments about corporate life nine to fives <laughs> and all that because all the kids my age like want to tweet about it and it makes no sense because they've never been exposed to it you know what i mean but this is a completely different side that i did not know about that's an interesting point. And it's funny because I, I don't have a degree. I didn't go to college. I couldn't uh, that afford was, was going to ask that as well, but okay, cool. cool. So, so this is what I did. Um, this is like a bonus. I tried to make it on my own selling life insurance and annuities and mutual funds. And I worked at the mall. I was selling jewelry. I already had one kid at this point. I'm like, what am I going to do uh, with my life? You know? And I, but I was a good salesman and I was really good at systematic follow-up. And I had this group of people that I called all the time. They said, oh yeah, call me back next quarter, next month, whatever. And one of them was the sales director for the company that went out of business because his uncle sued him. Yeah. And so the, the funny thing was he, one day I called him, he said, Hey, you know, I've got a guy here who's really not earning his salary. And you follow up with me pretty much on the dot. Every time I say, exactly when I say exactly in the way that I want you to, why don't you come interview with me and maybe you can, you know, have a job because I know that you're working hard. I know you're probably not making much money, which was true. And <laughs> the guy that I replaced had a four-year degree and he had the, all the credentials. Yeah. And I later looked up the job posting for this job and it was four-year degree required. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had made a huge leap because now that I had the experience working for a company that had an entry fee of a four-year degree, then I can make a lateral move to any other oh, company yeah, definitely. Yeah. and not need the degree because at that Surpass point, it's that, irrelevant. Yeah. I, it's always irrelevant, but I got to show my skills, which got me into the job. And then the irrelevant became officially irrelevant. So I didn't have to ever need that qualification again. So uh, I mean, that's the thing about corporate is once you get your first job or your second job, no one ever asks about your degree, your GPA, where you went to college. As you as you progress, that falls down on your resume each time. Yeah. And ultimately, oh, it yeah. just falls off, right? I mean, so, and you proved it. You proved it to be true. Yeah. I guess that's why interning used to be so popular when it was more of an uncrowded space. Unpaid intern, get the experience, use the experience, get the job. Yeah. All right. So that's interesting. So I would say there's like two sides of like, you know, business on Twitter. There's like physical product, which is like, you know, reselling, drop shipping, e-com all that, and like service based, like, you know, agency. And I feel like what you've done in the past would translate so well to agency stuff if you ever want to, you know, and that's like very popular on Twitter and everything like that. But let's shift over to that gut punch happened. And then how'd you get into reselling all that? Like, were you already on Twitter or like, how were you exposed to it and all that? Like, what, uh, you know, obviously was the shift to get you into doing the stuff you do now? Yeah, great question. So I was kind of on Twitter because I was trying to learn crypto. And <laughs> the funny thing about Twitter that I thought, I always thought Twitter's useless. It's just like people just like journaling into the air and liking and, and retweeting. What does this all mean, right? Well, crypto, crypto Twitter was really interesting to me because people who were big name crypto traders would say, this is going to happen and here's the chart and this is why I think it will. And then they would continue the thread. And so I thought, okay, I know nothing about trading or crypto. And if I follow these people, I can actually see their thought process and then how it plays out pretty much in real time with visuals. And I had never seen any kind of learning like that before. So on, on Twitter enough, you know, following these big guys in crypto, eventually you, you can get exposed to other places. And so yeah. I, I found Jose Rosado and he talks about building a Twitter following. I found Chris Johnson. He talks about building a personal brand. And I can't remember exactly who it was through, but one of those two led me down a rabbit trail to Joe Hart. Yeah. And so the scene is, I think it's about, let's see, April, May, June. Okay, so it's two months. Uh, we're in June. And I, when I got fired, I had about 10,000 bucks in the bank. And I didn't panic. I started making phone calls, reaching out to contacts. Day one, like as soon as I got fired, I started calling people. And then I, I started making an action plan. I said, okay, I'm going to apply to this many jobs per day. I'm finding virtual jobs. I was at work. Uh, the company was based in North Carolina and I 
in my, the office where I'm at now, and, which my boss had me build at my expense before he fired me. That's, that's, oh, that's that's right. there. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the money is getting low. I, 10 grand here, you know, tightening things up, maybe like two and a half months. And with I, the family and stuff too. Four kids at this time. So oh, you had four kids at this point. When I got fired, I had four I mean, kids. This, yeah, yeah, this is recent, man. This is only like 16, you know, 16, 17, 18 months ago. Yeah. So now I have five. We just had our fifth. But at this time, I've got four kids. I'm thinking, okay, we just went under, quote, two weeks to flatten the curve. And I, what I did is I made a system every time I applied for a job, which I tried a bunch of different industries, all the virtual jobs, work from home, different countries, different industries, some automotive, some sales. And I applied for exactly 130 jobs. I kept track of every one so I could follow up and I could make sure not to apply to the same one again. I found like 10, 12 different job boards and I was just hopeless. So 130 jobs. I maybe had like two or three interviews and then no offers. So, and it's pretty demoralizing because you start to think, wow, I suck. Like nobody will hire me. But also it was a very uncertain time in the world because everybody yeah, was yeah. staying at home and nobody knows what's going to happen. And, but I knew that the, the money was just like being whittled down. And that's about when I found Joe Hart. And so I took some of that money that was very precious to me at the time. And I bought his course, um, The Art of Flipping was what it was. And I said, okay, this guy, he goes to garage sales, he goes to thrift stores, he buys things and sells them on eBay. I could do this. I've sold on eBay before. Um, years ago, before Feldon Richards had his great phone repair course, I would actually buy broken phones back in 2014 or so. And I would just take them apart. And I figured out that people in other countries could buy the parts for like way more, like I would pay 20 bucks for a busted phone. And then I'd sell the motherboard for like a hundred bucks to somebody in Spain. That's so interesting. And, yeah. And I would do it through eBay. And it's crazy that I thought, oh, you could take that farther because Felden obviously made a huge oh, yeah. thing out of it. I mean, it's oh, amazing. Yeah, he's the man. I, yeah, I, Felden actually was one of the first guys I met on Twitter. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So anyway, I said, okay, I've been on eBay. Uh, I'm going to give this a shot. And I started going to thrift stores. I'm looking around. Uh, I mean, I just dove right in. I started buying things, selling them, checking the comps on eBay, that kind of thing. And then um, I... I don't, I must've been poking around on Twitter again, or maybe I was on his Gumroad page and I saw there's this group. And at the time it was 50 bucks a month. And I, and it, it, the promises, oh, you know, you can take your flipping to the next level, get leads, make more money. And at, at the time, I remember my mentality. Now I wouldn't even think about 50 bucks a month if it could make me money. Exactly. But then 50 yeah. bucks a month, I was thinking this is, my water bill or my cell phone bill. And I don't have a job. I don't have income. And the way it felt, it was so hard to pay that 50 bucks a month, but it was probably the best decision I made because I joined and I saw, oh, people are buying things from Walmart. They're buying things from Target. They're flipping them online. And my area, while it's small, I don't have as many stores, was vastly undershopped because it's just, it, it's not a huge metro area. The population is very spread out. So I had an interesting advantage and I hit the ground running. I started selling weights. I didn't get in on pools. I didn't get in on disinfectant, but I started finding the toys. I started finding the weights, selling them on eBay. And before I knew it, it was, I started my company on July, on July 15th so that I could get my tax exemption. And, uh, and soon after that, somebody told somebody in the group told me, you have to read toy folio. That's like the next thing. I said, okay, I'm sold at this point. I bought Toyfolio. And that's where I read about Amazon and Amazon being the next frontier and Christmas and toys. And so one of the things, and here's, here's an actionable nugget for going from zero to one. I, I was completely biased towards action because I had very little to lose at this point. Either my money's going to run out or I'm just going to spend it a little faster right? So if it doesn't work, I'm going to be in the same place as I was going to be anyway. I'm just going to get there a little faster, which would suck, but it's the what's same couple, place. What's a couple right? of weeks? What's a couple of weeks? <laughs> exactly. And, and then 
I, I just thought I'll figure it out from there. So having my back against the wall was the greatest thing because it made me so, I, I don't want to say reckless, but I like, I had no other choice. It was do this or just watch the money go away into the mortgage yeah. or whatnot. So, uh, so where was I? I started my LLC immediately. Drive I mean, I said, okay, kept, drive for it. I need to start an LLC. I'll do it. I got online. I did it in two hours. I got my resale certificate. It took no time at all. And then I said, okay, I read Toy Folio. I've got to get on Amazon right now. So again, I had dabbled in Amazon back in 2016, selling used DVDs and things like that. So I already had a seller account and I just had to reactivate it. Yeah. And from there I said, okay, I've got to get ungated in toys right now. I mean, when I thought, okay, this is the next step. I did it immediately. I didn't wait. I didn't like research. I didn't say, ah, I'll do it later. I, I did it immediately. And that way I was able to capitalize on flipping enough on eBay. I was soon doing 15, 20, $25,000 a month on eBay, just a couple of months in. Yeah. And using that money to go shop Walmart clearance in August and even into September, and then taking all that inventory and sending it in to Amazon for quarter four, which really was, I, that was all I needed was a six good months. And then I was off to the races. Yeah. And I think one a really important takeaway from stuff one, it's a really cool story. Like I would say, you know, that's why we bring out really interesting story. I think a lot of people are going to think that's cool, but definitely that you weren't afraid to pay for information because a lot of people are like very afraid of it. You know what I mean? And like neither of us sell, you know, probably well in the future, but ne none of us personally sell information. I guarantee you, I probably will in the future. You probably will as well. But like you were totally not afraid to invest in stuff. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we see a lot of people talk <laughs> about how when you're just getting started, you're afraid to pay for information. But like us today, you know, you, you said it yourself. We're not afraid to pay for stuff when we're pretty sure it's going to make us more money. But it's interesting that you, you know, you got Joe's course, saw stuff was kind of working out. You're like, oh, there's this group they'll tell me what to buy. I can turn my money into more money that way. And you weren't afraid to actually buy stuff. And it clearly, you know, accelerated the process. Who knows if it would have happened otherwise, but it definitely accelerated the process if it was already going to happen. And the fact that you were moving quick is a tell to sign that even if the reselling thing didn't work, you would have gotten on to the next thing quicker that you could have tried on that journey to figuring yeah. out what was going to work. Yeah. And part of the key for me, which is why I told you the story of the automotive business is when I saw that people were going to Walmart, buying things, selling them on eBay, it occurred to me that I was doing the exact, I, I said, this is the exact same business as the automotive business. Only instead of buying from China and selling to AutoZone, we're buying from Walmart place. and selling to the end consumer. And in my mind, I saw it, I saw it as identical. And I said, I bet I can do the same thing and generate massive cash flow because all you need is a good month or two to just do really heavy action, build the cash flow, and then you can start building your inventory and it just becomes a big snowball. And that's exactly how we did it in the automotive business. I had to get one eighty thousand dollar order, so a little bit different in that regard. But different. it was the whole game of the automotive business was we need more money so we can buy more inventory so that more people will buy more stuff so that we can buy more inventory. And it was just a game of building the cash flow, which yeah. it, the principle of it is extremely simple. Buy more stuff, sell more stuff, get more cash flow, buy more stuff, sell more stuff. That's all it is. Yeah, we talk, I mean, we talk about it all the time. When you have the discipline, at least starting out, to hold those profits in the business, it's crazy, crazy, crazy how quickly that business valuation starts to compound, right? Because 30%, over month, over month, over month, it makes a big difference. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you've been smart. You started to diversify into like the content side of things that you have over 10K on Twitter now. When was Oliver Flips born in this process of getting started, you know, with your reselling and everything? Well, my first Twitter account kind of died a slow death. It was, it was started when I found Jose Rosado mm -hmm. and it was called Win the Inner Game. I still have the account. They may be like 225 followers. And uh, I mean, it was kind of growing, but it was in the personal development sphere. And I, I'm an avid reader, read thousands of books oh, in yeah, my I life. Can I can tell in the background, man. Yeah, that you get the Yeah, that's my, yeah. my office collection. 
Uh, when it comes to paying for information, I have a huge library of books. Uh, I have an actual library. It's the front room of my house. It's lined with shelves, places to read, um, chairs, and so that my kids can be surrounded with information. On, I mean, I have books on everything, uh, hundreds and hundreds of books. Same way with courses. My Gumroad library is full. Even if I don't watch it right away, I want access to the information, not just on Google, but something that's been organized by somebody who's an expert in that field that's laid out in a roadmap and in a structure that you can read it and immediately take action. So, um, so growing a Twitter following was a, was a cool idea. And I, I forgot the, the mental, you know, personal development side of it. I said, okay, when the inner game was nice, I wrote a book called the champion's handbook. And uh, I, some people said it was really great, but it just, that's not, it doesn't sell as well, you know, unless and, you're, you're a big name and yeah. you do it the right way. I just couldn't do it the right way. I, I did. I wasn't cut out for it. So I started Oliver flips. I said, I'm going to start a new one, start over. And since I was in PFP, Joe Hart does some Twitter promotion and helps people. And, uh, and I said, Hey, Joe. And th remember here, money is still kind of hard to spend. Like I'm buying inventory. But Joe said, hey, it's this much. I'll work with you for a month. I'll retweet you a few times, get you some exposure. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to do it. And he, get, he helped me get to my first thousand followers. Which is by far the hardest. Like so many people yeah, that, are, that have been around even for months and years. Like it's getting over that hump. And then obviously 10K being the next hump. But like a thousand followers, you know, that's an accomplishment in itself. You got to be consistent putting stuff out and everything, but I didn't mean to interrupt you so you can get, carry on with that. No, that's fine. I mean, I just thought I'm going to document my journey. Maybe I have some knowledge from the warehouse and wholesale distribution that I've combined with flipping. I think that could be a unique value to people. And I've always been kind of a creative writer type. And so I thought maybe my personal brand might be something that a few people would enjoy. And Twitter you know, it'll be a cool project. Um, so I started with my first thousand followers. I grew to maybe 2000 by December. And that's when I started looking for more. And uh, Jose Rosado, I made a joke on one of his tweets. And remember, when you're on Twitter, the more followers you have, the more visible you are to everybody on Twitter. Oh, yeah. And so I had, I had maybe like 1800, something like that. And this was January. And, um, and I did something like, a, like Jose tweeted something. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, say, Hey, I want to hire you as a coach, just joking around. And, and, uh, and I said, how much? And he jokingly like threw out a number. Right. And I said, okay, tell me how to do it. You know, I said, okay, I'll do it again. Another uncomfortable amount of money. But yeah. he hopped into my DMs and he said, hey, you're really looking for, I don't know anything about your business, but maybe I can help you. So I hired Jose. We worked together for two or three months and he helped me. He said, you know, something that you can do as you gain experience in your areas, you can offer a high ticket coaching program and you can teach people how to start a business just like yours, but they don't have to make any of the mistakes yeah. on the way. Yeah. And, and so that... Uh, working with Jose completely opened my eyes to another tier of what a personal brand or being on the internet or being on Twitter can do. And so every, every time I made a jump and spent money, it always took me to this higher level of comprehension of how everything I learned about making money or doing business was wrong, right? Or maybe it wasn't wrong. It's just, you did, it wasn't the only way to do it. So what I mean by that is, if you want to go to college and get a job, you can do that and it's fine. And it's worked for people for, you know, 50, yeah, 60 years, something like that, years, right? Yeah. It's been really good. Uh, but, but there's a whole different way of making money like Jose using Google translate to write eBooks and making a hundred grand because he couldn't speak English well. And I mean, that kind of thing, you say it to a normal person on the street and they're just like, what? It exactly. doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, it's, you know? Yeah. So um, working with Jose led me to hire and work with Lawrence King, who I've been working with for like, I mean, it's going on a year now. And um, I've hired other coaches and mentors. Every time I want to learn something, I hire a coach and I just shell out 
you know, five grand and I learned something new on how to expand my business. Um, again, the things that these people spent tireless nights trying to figure out, I want to pay for that information and have it downloaded in my brain and have them on call to basically answer my questions when I can't figure something out or when I want to know. So that it's, it's just, it's turned into so much more than a business. It's turned into this incredible knowledge building and uh, just a personal development journey. And, you know, there's always new levels. Like I'm nowhere near where I could be, um, but I'm on my way. Yeah, exactly. Where, and it's where is that end destination, do you think? I don't know. There's no that, end. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah, I would assume, you know what I mean? And clearly, you know, it's worked, you know over 10k and everything and really building things up i know uh, you like have the email list which i'm sure you give some game. you have a free course as well right uh yeah i have a free course called how to make your first ten thousand reselling i usually release it once a month mm, that's what i i thought yeah i thought uh like i only see it every once in a while yeah we're there it's usually in the beginning of the month mm -hmm. all right cool so you want to tell us a little bit about your current business model are you doing wholesale are you doing retail arbitrage still what you got going on maybe categories you sell and we'll kind of talk about what you're uh, doing currently amazon wise yeah so currently i'm kind of in a, a restructuring phase i usually will uh, it seems to be the pattern so far i'll do really really well i have a big month i'll sit on a little bit of that cash so i can step back and make sure that I can sustain that growth moving forward. So I'm kind of on a three month cycle where uh, I have a really great month and I work a ton. And then I take the next month to really step back and try and grow in a way that's going to make my next three month cycle even bigger. And I mean, you can see this on my sales chart. It's big month, a little bit of a smaller month, a little bit of a bigger month, big month, you know, it's kind of staggered like that. And so right now, I love arbitrage. I have a feeling that the third-party platforms are going to make it more difficult for arbitrage in the future. It's just kind of the progression over the years. It gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, I'm still really heavy into arbitrage. I like the toy category. I like health and beauty. I like grocery. Uh, I do some apparel. I love the pet category right now. Um, more people, there are more pets in the U.S. than kids. Yeah, so, somewhat was that you that tweeted that, that out the other day? Or I saw that on Twitter no. literally yes yesterday, and I was yeah. like, wow, I never never really thought about that, but it's true. Yeah, uh, fur babies, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I I like uh, I'm currently in the process of hiring a VA. I've nice. hired a firm to interview people for me and stuff like that. And so they'll be trained to do most of the sifting through the data and tactical arbitrage and tactical nice, bucket. Yeah. That was my next my next question was yeah what software is using so you doing mostly ta then yeah tactical arbitrage i like doing manual sourcing on keepa i even use brickseek oh, um, yeah, on yeah. brickseek i don't really go so much for the local stuff as i do subscribe to the online alerts that's interesting and i've never i didn't even know they had that section of the site to be honest online alerts they have maybe maybe hundreds of categories uh dozens if not hundreds but they are I mean, everything you can think of. So I get alerts for dolls. I get alerts for perfumes. I get alerts for cell phones, but those have been kind of junky. You can even have alerts for brick building sets. So I, somebody showed me, hey, this Lego set, they had a screenshot. It was 17 bucks on walmart.com. Beautiful. And it sold out in maybe 20 minutes. And who knows how many of those things you could have bought. I would have gone deep, deep, deep. Because instantly, once they were sold out, the price is 75, 80 on Amazon. And that's just a huge yeah, payday. That's good. Like probably 150%, 160% ROI, something like that. Yeah. So I said, is there a way that I can know if Walmart marks something down online? And I said, well, if there is, if I don't have a custom monitor, because how can you monitor everything for these price tips? I don't know how to code. I don't know how to put a monitor on Walmart server and find like 70% off stuff. But there's a website already doing that. It's BrickSeek. So I started... And this is where I really became, became pro at BrickSeek. I mean, I, I teach people in my custom coaching yeah. how to use BrickSeek. And some of them have used BrickSeek for a long time and they had no idea it did even half that stuff. But one of the things was online alerts. So I said, okay, I can set an alert for brick building sets. And that will alert me if a mega constructs or uh, 
a Duplo or a Lego goes on sale and it just pops up into my inbox and I can go and I can buy the deal. Uh, and it'll find it on Best Buy as well. So any of the sites that BrickSeek monitors, it will find in those categories and you can pick so many categories. So what I do is I, I'll set alerts for a few categories and I'll get some alerts and I'll see, okay, um, is this something that normally pans out? So I was trying out cell phones because sometimes cell phones go on crazy sales on BrickSeek, at least locally, and you can turn a quick, you know, 50 or 60 bucks, but it turned out to be no good. But perfumes, on the other hand, uh, now that I'm in the FBA dangerous goods program, perfumes, FBA are a really great ROI item and they move super, super small quick. Too. Yeah. No storage space yep. taken up really at all. And some of these, even third-party sellers, um, I found one by Pharmapax, which is a huge mm. Amazon seller. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know who Pharma, it's the, they're the number one in North America, right? Seller. I think they're yeah. going public, which is insane that a third-party seller on a different site is going public. But yeah, that's just crazy, man. And so, they do only they do only merchant fulfilled too. Which is weird too, but bonkers, it, it, yeah. But yeah, so one thing and kind of story here. So when Garrett and I first met, he put me on to Tactical Expander, which is kind of, you know, a new frontier to an already explored place being Tactical Arbitrage. It's interesting to hear you, one, give a ton of game on that break. Like that, that's making my head spin. I'm going to re-listen to this so I can soak up some more of that game. But yeah, people who are listeners on here right now, you just got, go try out some of that stuff because that's really interesting. But it's going where other people aren't. You know what I mean? Like everyone's in Discord groups everyone's you know doing whatever but not everyone is using the ex the tactical expanders the tactical buckets of the world not everyone's going deeper on bricks you can using it for online arbitrage and that's interesting and it really shows you kind of build out your own methods of doing things after you've been doing it. like i i literally i'm almost entirely manual sourcing these days no so i don't even have a ta subscription when that's what garrett and i used to do all the time back in march april when we were starting so it's interesting to hear how you've kind of dug in your own methods that like that you're the first one I ever heard like talk about those methods. So, and that's clearly why you're having success because you're going where other people aren't. That's where the goodies are. Yeah, absolutely. And especially like Nate Ellis too, like his tweet, he, he gives a lot of good game on that. Like keep a product finder. I was screwing around with that yesterday. I had never tried that either. Are you uh, doing any of that kind of stuff? Uh, have you ever used keep a product finder with tactical arbitrage? You see, I have not at all. Um, Garrett, you ever even heard of that? In conjunction? No, not no. together. I think if you want to get surgical, that's, that's, the uh, so if you use keep a product finder and you, you, so you're already narrowing it down by the parameters that are that very specific, right? Yeah, you want right. Amazon out of stock 50% of the time, or you want it in this category, this sales rank, so on and so forth. Uh, you can, on the results page, if you bring it to the max allowable, which is like 5,000 rows, you can bulk export that to a CSV file. And then you can right. go back. And so let's say you start at rank uh, from rank one to 20,000 on a 90 day average, export it to a CSV file. I try and get something like eight, nine, 10,000 results per uh, per search. And I'll, and then um, I actually go in, I use the keep, I use an API on Keepa mm -hmm. and I take the, the API URL and I manually change the rank from one to 10,000 to 10 or sorry, one to 20,000 to 20 to 40,000 in the API. And that way I can, in like five minutes, I can have 50,000 ASINs in a CSV. And then I take those 50,000 ASINs in the CSV and I do a reverse search using the wholesale function on tactical yeah, I knew arbitrage. I going to say that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So 50,000 ASINs, uh, five to 10 minutes is all it takes to get 50,000 ASINs according to your search parameters and keep a product finder. And then you can just rinse and repeat over as many categories as you like. And if your API uh, key allows you a certain, you know, enough tokens, you can run scans on TA of 200, 250,000 ASINs a day, no problem. All right, that was crazy. To our newer viewers, it doesn't have to be that complicated, but this is some advanced stuff. Like you're obviously doing big numbers. So this, 
is what it takes if you really w- want to find the blue oceans of the world. But that okay, that that was like once again that part I'm gonna re-listen to again. Me and you, we'll get on Zoom and I'm gonna I'll show you I'll show you the repricing stuff we've been talking about. And right, we'll, right. Yeah, we'll we'll go All back right, and forth good. with that. But really interesting stuff. Really, really interesting stuff. Garrett, that was like way above my head to be honest. Like what what we get into. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that that is really really neat stuff. That would be a good clip. Definitely. So, yeah, so that was, you know, interesting kind of hearing that, you know, 18, 20 month, 16 month journey, whatever, kind of really transforming, you know, what you do day to day and everything. What are the people in your life that you knew prior to Oliver Flips, the reselling business? What do they, what do they think of all the stuff you're up to now? Like, how much do they know about like all that? I'm always curious, uh, you know, from our guests who have big followings who you know, doing big things, all that. Well, I... I mean, it, most of them, it's just way over their head, right? Hey, grandma, I started a social media brand. That's <laughs> nice, dear. You know, yeah, like, yeah, I, I, I've, <laughs> see, I've seen you tweet that like, exact same thing from me too. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my mom is an author and she writes like clean romance fiction and she thinks it's cool because she's tried to build one for years. And I'm just like, oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. You know, uh, everything else. I mean, the people that I kind of grew up with, went to high school with, worked with, I'm kind of, I was always kind of a risk taker. And a couple of my friends described me as a wild card. So, you know, I've got one good friend. We, we make trades together during the week and it's because we're both interested in the market. But he said in high school, I'm going to go to college for four years and get a finance degree. And I'm going to go work for a company get some experience and I'm going to go get my master's and then I'm going to go work for a bigger company. And then maybe I'm going to start a business. I like knew that, it. I knew that was coming at the end. Right. Yeah. But here's the thing. He he's on. So he went to college for four years, got a finance degree. He went to work for uh, Deutsche bank or something. <laughs> and then he went and got his master's and now he works for, I think Exxon managing their, uh, uh, what I mean, what's stock term for like precious metals? He manages their gold and their silver portfolio oh, and all that um, kind of stuff. Some, uh, treasuries or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, maybe he does like treasury, but I don't know. But anyway, I mean, he followed the plan exactly. And everybody you could kind of see like that they were on the path and they knew what they were going to do. I had no clue. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so in a way, the fact that nobody knew where I was going to end up, I ended up exactly where they thought, just some random place, building a Twitter having exactly. an Amazon business. And you didn't, you need, you tried a whole bunch of stuff to get there, but you didn't need to, you know, take out debt to go to school or whatever, and, you know, really commit to anything that not need to commit. And, you know, yeah, starting reselling, you know, you can start with no money, just selling like your old stuff, you know, on eBay and stuff like that. That's typically what I recommend to people that are just looking to test it out and everything. But what are some of your top recommendations for people who are brand new getting into just reselling in general, maybe Amazon, eBay, all that? Well, I started with 500 bucks. And that was like my inventory budget. And I'm, as of this, as of like coming on this call, I was a hundred dollars away from hitting 300 grand for the year. So that's a pretty big snowball. Um, And that's, you know, about, like you said, 16, 18 months, something like that. My biggest tip would just be, it, it sounds cliche, but you, you can research a certain amount but you're only going to truly learn experientially. So doing it brings an understanding. It's like studying how to fly a plane versus flying a plane. You do need to study, you need the technical knowledge, but a desk pilot has never flown a plane and you can't truly know what it's like to fly a plane until you actually get in the cockpit. You know, so, we try. Well, that was a really good way to put it. And all of us try to say that in a different way on Twitter pretty much every day, but it's so true. And it's just something people need to accept and just, you know, get after it and try stuff. My, my biggest win was getting on Amazon as soon as possible and starting to get ungated. And even today, when my students ask me, should I sell this? How many should I buy? What I always tell them is buy five or 10 and test it out because even when you're looking at keep it even when you're looking at the rank some things are ranked really well and sell slow and then i've got stuff 200,000 in toys and i can't keep them in stock you know so there's no way to really know until you do it and that continues to be true mm-hmm. 
All right. Another, uh, another interesting question. So what's the main bottleneck for you right now? Is it capital or is it the product? Cause there's pretty much two main bottlenecks you can run into. Garrett says this sometimes, but you, there's either not enough yep. products to buy or not enough money to access the products, you know, you want to buy. What's like the big kind of hiccup right now for you that you're running into? It's, it's time and capital. Interesting. Okay. I have way, I mean, I, I think I'm going to launch a leads list soon. You should do definitely with the stuff you're doing. You absolutely should. Yeah. I mean, I probably don't buy 50 or 60 leads a week just because I, I have to allocate my capital Mm -hmm. and getting funding at this point, I'm securing tiny bits of funding, paying it off. I mean, like, you know, 15 grand, six grand, stuff like that. Little tiny loans, just so I can pay them off and maybe get bigger amounts that I can use to leverage and scale faster. But you know, when you're just starting out, I'm still under two years. It's hard to get that really big chunk. And yeah, so, has, has Amazon offered you a loan? Yeah, uh, it's crazy, man. Like I, I have. Miles been, is so salty. One of our friends is doing <laughs> multiple hundred k a month and hasn't been offered either. And his account's two years old, and my account's two years old too. Oh, it's, that's it's wild. Weird. Yeah, I don't know why, but yeah, that, that's I, interesting. I don't know what makes it. You know, it's a small one that I'm just going to pay off early and. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they give me a bigger one. Oh yeah, probably will. Hopefully. Yeah. I know a guy who knows a guy and I don't know what prep center he runs, uh, but he, Amazon offered him like a thousand dollar loan. He took it, paid it off. Then they offered him 15 grand. He took it, he paid it off. Then they offered him a hundred grand and he took it and started a prep center. And now he's do he's at like almost a million a year in revenue in the prep the center prep. or yeah. wow that's great that's that's really really neat yeah and it, it's interesting just hearing how that all works and everything and it's so cool that amazon offers funding to sellers to be honest because they end up making way more and we end up you it's know so it's smart. a very synonymous relationship yeah it's it's so an interesting smart. thing that i definitely wouldn't wouldn't have thought of from a platform's perspective but uh very so, interesting to hear about yeah garrett what you got so your second bottleneck was time can you go into sort of like what is where, where your, um, you know, shortcomings are in terms of how much time you have. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got, I'm married with five kids, right? I've got household duties. Um, fortunately cash flow enables me to like, if something needs fixed, you know, I could just hire somebody to fix it, but there's still, my presence is needed. You know, five kids right. need a lot of attention. Um, there's, uh, I mean, the scale of Amazon, just the amount that is coming in and going out both merchant fulfilled and FBA. And so, uh, and then looking through, I mean, I've got, I've always got at least two or three tactical arbitrage scans running. Um, Sometimes I have as many as seven and I've got maybe seven more queued. And uh, I've always got thousands of things to look through and there's just never enough time. Uh, and then of course there's things I want to do. Like I want to read a book. I want to go for a walk. I want to go to the beach or whatever. So, so last month I did my first $50,000 month and then October, I haven't even looked, I must be at 40, but I took some of the capital from the $50,000 month. I said, okay, I need to do something with this. So I hired a family member full-time who does all my prep packs, all my packages. So I don't have to do that anymore because I hate it takes a lot of time. Um, and then I'm hopefully going to hire somebody from my wife's side of the family to come in and help with that. Uh, I brought on a prep center as well so that I could start diverting things to the prep center so I can merchant fulfill things like some things on Amazon that make sense, quick flips, uh, and then my eBay business, which I've been growing again. And, and then of course the VA who's going to probably be the tactical arbitrage person. Um, but also, I'm I'm rereading Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Oh, I'm sure that has you thinking of all different types of stuff. Definitely, man. I'm a completely different person when from when the last time I read it. So now, I mean, the whole thing is about creating cash flow businesses and hiring VAs and how to manage them. Yeah, and you so, hire the first one. Yeah. So I've got all these personal tasks, calling, emailing people that I hate doing, that are just related to like my car got fixed or this insurance claim on my house, like so, so on and so forth. My VA, I hired a general VA that I'm going to train on tactical arbitrage, but uh, probably half of their job is just going to be personal errands. 
so that I just never have to think about that stuff. And then the second VA I hire will probably be solely tactical arbitrage. Um, but that's an interesting world that, you know, I, I mean, I'm probably going to pay on the higher end to get a really good experienced VA, like 650, 700 a month. But still, 700 a month with my cash flow is a reasonable expense to maybe double or triple my output. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that is very worth it, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah, and not do stuff that I don't want to do, like follow up with my, my claims adjuster for my roof damage for the hundredth time. Mm -hmm. I, and the, I mean, maybe they can get a response. I don't know. That's the kind of stuff that I just don't want to do anymore. Yeah. And so yeah. I kind of switching things up for maybe a final question or two, what is your process for content creation? Cause you had mentioned that like you wrote a book, your mom's an author. It seems like you're kind of a writer, like you enjoy that kind of stuff, but how do you go about creating the volume of content you do? Um, well, I mean, right now it's mostly on Twitter and then I've got my emails. Uh, I, I have, I used to be the president of my local Toastmasters before the pandemic. So telling stories, public speaking, that was something that I thought was a rare and valuable skill and becoming more rare and more valuable. And so it's always something I've tried to, to cultivate and improve at least over the past three years or so. And um, I, I think that writing like emails is a story. You know, you probably want to tell a story, give valuable information. And uh, being on Twitter has helped a ton with content creation because I want to see, like, I want to open up the watch and see how the gears work. So just knowing how I can deliver information in a way that's going to click with people and going to entertain them and make them want to engage. And for me, it's kind of been an artsy science where I, I'm, I'm testing things. Um, oh, I think I want to phrase this tweet this way. How can I, how can I do it? Or, I mean, my mind, it's, it's really hard for me to say a process because my mind is geared towards um, organizing things and categorizing them. So it kind of comes naturally. If I write a thread, uh, I just think, what's the most logical way to put this? What order? What information should I include? What's not relevant? You know, I, I don't know if I have a lot to offer for content creation. Well, it gets working, Advice. clearly. And, and yeah, whatever you, whatever you do, it's working. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, uh, what worked was hiring Lawrence King to tell me how to write tweets. Hey, that Yeah, that, I'm a big Lawrence guy. I know he does some Amazon private label stuff and has for a while, I think. That's so hopefully where he's, we'll get he started, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll get him on here sometime. But uh, very good. Garrett, you got any other questions? Do you see yourself, your Twitter following, having gotten to this point without your coaches that you hired? Absolutely you think you would not. ever get to this point? Yeah. I no. mean, maybe if, but if it would I, it's taken a lot longer. Well, the thing is, there is a predict. I mean, okay. You see this on Twitter lesson, few unpopular opinion. Right. People are programmed. I'm literally quoting Lawrence. People are programmed to like and engage with certain things. And first you start by imitating and I am a master imitator. I can see somebody do something. I can copy it identically. I've, I've skateboarded. I've surfed. I've built furniture. There's a whole bunch of things that I can pick up and learn really quickly just because I'm good at copying. And everybody, no matter what they're doing, they start out copying because that's the only way they know how to do it. The person that taught them showed them and then they did it that way. But the key is you don't keep copying. Then you make it your own. And you do it so many times and you say, what if I did it this way? What if I changed that? What if I tweaked this detail? And then you start to form, that's when you truly become a creator. Nobody creates anything original. We're all a remix of a remix of a remix of a remix. Right. So when it comes to content creation, I started by copying formats that I saw on Twitter or on email and then it just grew to understanding the principles. So I don't have to copy the outline anymore. I can, I, I just can say, oh, this tweet would be based on this principle that people engage with. You know, copying just shows you, um, I'm kind of rambling a little bit. So maybe no, I'm that's gonna stop, a, a very inter interesting breakdown of yeah. stuff and kind of phrased it the way I hadn't heard it before. 
Definitely. Um, but yeah, man, really, really appreciate it. I thought this went a completely different direction than I thought to. I learned a ton in this episode. I'm sure Garrett did. Yeah, the answers well. are so, super high level. We appreciate yeah, that for we're sure. We're very thankful for you coming on. Where can everyone find you on the socials? Yeah, so I am at Oliver Flips on Twitter. And if you want to follow my Instagram, which is small at the moment, but I do publish content there, including useful threads, it's at Oliver's Flip Finds. Oh, a little, little different there. It, what, is there a, is there already an Oliver Flips on Instagram? He is Garrett? inactive and would not sell me his handle. You know, Garrett, <laughs> Garrett, Garrett, Mister All Out Amazon with two ends is running into the same thing. So yes, that's a shame. Yes. But yes, yeah, years like, of inactivity. Big thank you for coming on. This was awesome. I'm did excited you, to uh, employ some of these things. Did you get any questions from the tweet you posted? Uh, so I remember one of them was from my boy YTK now that you bring it up, but he, we kind of answered in terms of like time management with, uh, like I, he asked like about time management with having a family and everything. Oh uh, yeah. Right. 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 About it. But big yep. shout out yeah, to YTK for the question. That's a very good dude. I hope he's listening to this very good guy, but yeah, big, thank you for coming on, man. That's very good episode. And thank you to all our listeners as well for spending some time with us. We hope you enjoy your Tuesday, which is the day this will drop or whenever you're listening to this, but thank you guys. And we'll see you in the next one.